you've made it to the very last topic of this entire soft skills training and so i congratulate you i'm happy for your progress and i hope you've learned a lot along this journey you can drop a comment right now and share with me what are the things that you've learned what are you particularly excited about that you gained from this entire soft skills training take a minute and drop it in the comment section i want to know about it so today's topic we're going to be looking at peace building and conflict management for economic development and we're basically going to look at the connection between peace building and economic development and how to recognize conflict, the types and causes, how to recognize peace, the types and causes, the basic skills that we need to acquire to re provide response to conflict, and then the skills that we need to acquire to be able to be sensitive to issues that could occur. And don't forget that you're supposed to take this pretest at this link. Go ahead and take this pretest at this link before we continue. And once again, you are listening to the voice of Azimit Uzoije. Let's look at what conflict is. What do you think conflict is? When you think of the word conflict, what comes to mind? So let's look at a few um, definitions. Conflict is a misunderstanding or disagreement between two people or two groups. So you already know that the word conflict means there's a disagreement, there's a misunderstanding. The two people or the two groups are not in commonality. They don't have a common understanding or agreement. Conflict could also involve arguments around beliefs, around ideas, around values. So conflict could be when two people have different ideas about something, different beliefs about something, different value systems, and then they are having an argument about it. Another thing is that conflict can be destructive, it can be constructive. That means that there are situations where conflict can be very dangerous. There are situations where conflict can help to actually bring about change, can help to build up something. Right, so we've seen a context of what conflict looks like. Then do you think we can live without conflict? Do you think day to day, we actually need to live without conflict? Do you think there's a day that ever goes by that you don't have conflict. Think about it for a second. I just want you to take a pause and think about it. Is it yes that is on your mind or is it no? Okay, let's find out. The truth is we cannot live without conflict. Conflict is a part of every human being. It's an integral part of a human being. And the truth is that conflict can be neutral. It can be um, neither positive or negative. What is actually... Um, negative or positive is the way we react to or handle conflict that is what makes it positive or negative and handling conflict depends on the way the conflict is perceived so perception plays a key role in how conflict is perceived and that perception could be because of how you were brought up because of education because of socialization and things like that so when you think about it this way you see that we can't live without conflict Daily, we may even have conflict with our own selves. When you're trying to decide, oh, what do you wear to work? What do you wear to step out for the day? And then you have to make a choice between two things. It's like you have a disagreement with yourself on what to choose. That's conflict. How you perceive it could be positive or negative. At that moment, your perception is that, oh, it's just a choice that you have to make and you have to quickly decide. The same way it occurs in the society. When you, you see two people are having disagreement the issue there is how they are able to handle that disagreement that's what could make it have a positive or a negative outcome so this is something that i want us to bear in mind that conflict is very neutral it's neither positive or negative what is actually positive or negative is how we respond how we react how we handle conflict and how we handle conflict depends on our education our experiences our background our socialization level. Now, what are the things that causes conflict? Let's look at some of them. Things like poor communication. When two people do not communicate very well, they don't have a common understanding about something, there's bound to be conflict. When there's lack of compromise, maybe two groups or two people are having some misunderstanding over something. One person does not want to compromise, then there's bound to be conflict. When needs are not met between two people or two groups, 
there's bound to be conflict. And then when needs are not met, maybe at that point, the solution could be la uh, could be compromised. But then when the two of them decide, oh, there's not going to be any compromise, there's bound to be conflict. Prejudice could also cause conflict. Intolerance could also cause conflict. When a party has more self-interest in something, everybody has self-interest that they're pursuing in something, it could also cause conflict. Ignorance could cause conflict. When two people are ignorant about something, they think, oh, this should be it. The other one thinks, no, this is the right way. I'm educated. We're educated. This should be the right way. But the other one ha is, is, not, is not fully aware, just like the other person. This could lead to conflict. Desire for power could lead to conflict. Lack of empathy could lead to conflict. Making assumptions could lead to conflict. All these things listed here are not the only things that could lead to conflict. This is just an example. There are lots of things that could lead to conflict. I remember what actually makes it negative or positive is the perception, how it is handled. So, the truth is that conflict can exist among individuals and groups of people. And when we talk about perception, it, it depends on how people see things. Okay, so I'll show us some diagrams, right? Look at this thing very, very well. What image do you see? Now, this is going to be a game that we're going to do. Screenshot this thing, share it on WhatsApp, and say how many things you can see from this image. What do you really see from this image? All right? Screenshot this as well. Tell us how many things can you see from this image. Tell us this is going to be an exciting game. Just screenshot it and post it on, on, on Slack. Share with us how many images you can see here, how many things you can see here. What do you understand by it? What do you see here? What do you understand by this? You're going to notice that people that have played this game before may actually um, see more things. So if you've played this game before, don't forget to share with us and tell us, oh, you've actually played it before. If it's your first time, don't forget to tell us that you've actually that this is actually your first time. What I want us to get from it is to see how perception can color the way we see things. A lot of people may see just one thing here. A lot of people may see even things that are not here. So we're going to just... um. Watch this very well. Be sure to study it, post it on WhatsApp, share the things that you are seeing from this picture, and then um, we will see how perception colors the way we see things. Now, this little game is just to show us that perception plays a key role in how conflict is managed. When people see things from different angles, then you see that the other party bounds, the, the two parties that are involved are bound to have conflict. Now, perception influences conflict because perception is the way in which something is regarded, understood, or interpreted. All right? From this image, you will see that the way you are seeing something could be because, oh, you just spent time, you saw something. Someone else may look at it and say, this, this image makes no sense to me. I'm seeing nothing. Okay? So you see that perception is the way in which something is regarded, understood, or interpreted. And perception is the driving force that uh, is behind our reaction to things. Because of how you perceive things, it, it colors the way you react to things. It detects the way you react to things. Perception is influenced by things like education, okay? Interactions. Interactions was why I said if you've seen those pictures to, before, you should mention it. Because we'll see how perception may color things, all right? Perception is caused by things that, like environment. Culture. Someone that is from another culture may not take the same way that you see, that you think, or, or the same way that you see things. Perception is influenced by leaves. Perception is influenced by expectations. And these perceptions are the things that influences conflict and its outcome. Now, I want you to take a second and think about it. There, there are instances where in workplaces, construction sites, training centers, conflict could just occur. I know we've been doing lots of training online, and so maybe you may not have um, had a direct physical conflict, but maybe there are situations where you had a virtual conflict with someone that is part of this program. How did you handle it? What do you think was the cause? Most, most times it was poor communication. Most times it was misunderstanding. The other person did not understand something very well. The other person saw it differently, right? So just think about it and, and just get to to pinpoint what do you really think was the cause of one that comes to your mind right now so the thing is let's look at the relationship between conflict and violence right 
I'm going to show you these stories here. Read it very well. So, in the first one, it says, in a, in a disagreement between Obina and Emeka in the workshop, Obi Emeka pulled a spanner and smashed Obina on the head three times. Which of these, all these four examples here, is an example of um, violence? Then, the second one, Emem supervisor Mrs. Inimfom refused to approve a training due him for months with the excuse that Emem always reports to work late. Another one, Mr. Malaika repeatedly refused Belema from taking part in training programs with the excuse that Belema dresses indecently by wearing a nose ring and sagging jean trousers. Another one is Pastor Edmond yelled on Minima for not being able to pray as directed in a morning devotion or prayer session in the training center. Which of these four incidences are conflicts which of them are violence just screenshot it and let us know in the slack channel you can give your reasons why you think it is so this is something that i want you to dwell on and give your thoughts on it so let's look at what violence really is violence is the intentional use of physical force threatened or actual against oneself that means someone can actually um, use physical um, force against their own self against their own self, not even against someone else. Someone can threaten or use actual physical force against their own self or against another person or against another group. And then which results or has a high likelihood of resulting in this thing in these things, injury, death, psychological harm or deprivation. Are you seeing how conflict is it, is it, 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 it happens? So violent so violence is the intentional use of physical force, threatened or actual, against oneself, another person, or against a group, which either results in these things. All right. So I want us to get it clearly. Violence occurs when an individual or a group is avoidably prevented from reaching their full potential. When people feel like they are being denied something, the next thing is that they are very likely to resort to violence. All right. Violence results as a result of the inability of an individual to manage conflict. So I want us to see how this relates. Is when an individual is not able to manage conflict, is when a group is not able to manage conflict, that's what leads to violence, right? Violence has no positive effect side, unlike conflict. So remember we mentioned that conflict is neutral, all right? But the reaction you give to it is what makes it neutral, is what makes it positive or negative. But with violence, we are seeing it has no positive side at all. It's just negative. The outcome is not admirable. The outcome is not something that is pleasant. Now, there are about four different types of violence that exist. The first is, is physical violence. Physical violence is where there is application of force by an individual or by a group of people to another for the purpose of injuring the other party. So you, you see that there are instances of um, murder, injury, rape, that's physical violence because there's application of force by an individual or group to another party. That is classified as physical violence. Another one is structural violence. And in this one, you see that it's any form of institutional discrimination. All right, that maintains a person in a subordinate position. So that subordinate position could be physical or ideological. All right. So you see that some people are, are regarded in a certain way. They are subordinated in a certain position. And those people now feel in, in, in inadequate to another class of people. Example of structural violence is racism. And I hope this is a vivid example. You already know what racism is like the very next one is cultural violence and cultural violence refers to those aspects of a culture that can be used to legitimize violence that can be used to legitimize make violence seem legitimate all right and sometimes it comes packaged under religion it comes packaged under ideology it comes packaged under language or art 
right? Examples of cultural violence include tribal markings and female genital mutilation. They come packaged as part of a culture, part of a religion, an ideology, something good. But then it is actually violence because it's marked on that culture. Another one is psychological violence. It occurs when a group, group of people or a person uses hostile behavior, things like gestures, words, to cause emotional damage to another group of, or, or person. So psychological violence could mean when people are using words, they're using bad words, hostile words, gestures, right? They're using signs that are not encouraging, that are not positive, to cause emotional damage to another person or group. So I hope by now you've understood the relationship between conflict and violence. You know that they are not the same thing. You know that violence is entirely different from conflict. Let's now move to something else, peace. Let's look at the concept of peace. What is peace all about, all right? So in simple terms, peace is a time without any fights or war. However, it is not just about the absence of war. So this is a very complex term if you look at it that way. Peace could be defined as a time without any fights or war. However, it is much more than the absence of war. And this is because several conditions must be met for peace to be reached and maintained, right? So there are situations where you see a society does not have fight, it does not have war, but that society cannot really be classified as peaceful. And that is because the conditions have not been met. You may see that there is no form of justice that can be reached through formal or informal institutions. There is no social stability. And in such situations, you see that the concept of peace is not really existent there. Peace is a condition that ensures justice and social stability through formal and informal institutions, practices, and norms. There are countries that are classified as entirely peaceful. Switzerland is one of it. And funnily, they call their police force police unit. They don't use the word force, all right? Now, that's just an example to show you that sometimes the concept of peace may be seen more with civilized countries than developing nations, all right? So the concept of peace is something about not being just about the absence of war, but are there conditions that have been met? Do the conditions ensure justice? Do they ensure social stability? Then that's when you can start saying that there's peace in the society. Now, there's a concept that is called peacemaker, all right? And we're going to be looking at these two examples. These are uh, diagrams, images that shows a gun. This here is a gun. And this here is a first bomber of uh, the U.S. Air Force, right? So these things were named peacemakers, quite ironical, right? Seeing that this is a gun that can be used to end one's life, seeing that this is an air bomber, they were named peacemaker, all right? So doesn't this um, seem ironical? Let's look at what peacemaker is. Who is a peacemaker? A peacemaker is one who tries to create harmony or make peace. A peacemaker is one who makes peace by settling the disagreements or quarrels of others. A peacemaker acts on assumed superior power or strength and sometimes uses force. So you see that this all makes sense, right? These are peacemakers. They end disagreements, of course, because maybe the other person could be silenced or killed, right? They use force. So it makes sense to name this, these two things peacemakers, right? So we are seeing where the concept is um, fully exemplified with those diagrams. So peacemaker could also be used to define an a reactive individual that tries to address open conflict amongst people, right? So I'll give an example. If uh, in, the, in, the, in the holy books, in the Bible, there was a time um, Moses wanted to settle dispute between two people, right? wanted to set to address open conflict. It was based on reaction. And he was um, rebuked for such approach. That, that could almost be seen as a peacemaker situation. He was reacting, oh, I need to settle this conflict. Just settle it just like that. Oh, I'm forcing both of you to make peace. That is what a peacemaker is like. But do you know that the concept of peacemaker is different from peace builder? There's a reason why this topic says peace building and not peacemaker. 
All right. So let's look at what peace building is. A peace builder is one that professes and practices positive peace. If you actually look at the concept of peacemaker, you will see that uh, the peace that is resulted in is not really positive peace. It could be negative peace because there's use of force because there's it is so forceful. It, there's no it's not about complete resolution. It's like an end to everything that is happening, and it doesn't really care whether there is loss of life. Okay, but peace builder deploys strategic peace building path in addressing issues. So the concept of peace building is a situation where strategies are employed to consolidate peaceful relations. It's not just about ending the conflict, it's about ensuring that relations going forward are peaceful, that the environment going forward is peaceful, so that that conflict, so that that tension, so that that violence will not result again. All right? So these are things that a peace builder does. Peace builder is not just about ending the conflict for the then and then moving on. It's not just about forcing everybody to end their disagreement and that's it. Peace builder is ensuring that there's a consolidation of peaceful relations. All right? That those conflicts, those violence, those tensions do not result again that may lead to those um, situations. Now, there's something called a strategic peace building pathway. All right? When we talked about a peace builder deploying strategic peace building and addressing issues, this is what it looks like. Now, when you look at this diagram in this inner circle, you see the three major areas of strategic peace building. So when it comes to this part, you see that there is um, an effort in this side for violence prevention, conflict response and transformation to make sure that there are efforts to prevent respond to and transform violent conflict. There are efforts to make sure that there's prevention of violent conflict. There's efforts to respond to violence, violent conflict, especially when it has occurred. There's efforts to transform it, even after it has occurred. When it comes to this other area, justice and healing, there are efforts to promote justice and healing amongst the people that are, uh, have experienced conflict or violence. All right? When it comes to this structural and institutional change, there are efforts to promote structural and institutional change. Now, this is the inner circle. The outer circle here highlights the sub areas of practice. Okay, the sub areas. So, if you look at this very well, you are seeing what are the things that can be used to stop violence. All right, what are the things that can be used to respond to violence, to transform violent conflict? So, you see things like education. Education can be used. The people that are involved in a conflict, in violence, can be better educated. Remember, we mentioned ignorance as one of the factors that could cause conflict. So when education is brought in, then the people that are involved can know better and make better decisions than turn away from conflict and violence. So another thing that we see there is dialogue or conflict re resolution strategies, right? Dialogue is a very uh, interesting process that... Um, Peace builders use a lot because in dialogue, you see that the two parties come together and actually have conversations. And there are strategies that are used in making all of this to happen because the two parties may decide, oh, I'm not ready to talk to the other party. Maybe they are unreasonable. I'm not yet ready to do that. And a peace builder comes up with creative ways of making both sides to see why dialogue is important. There are also situations that the peace builder understands, oh, based on the conversation with the two parties, dialogue and conflict resolution is not what should be used at that point in time. Maybe the, the two parties have not come to that point where they realize that dialogue is necessary. Another one is non-violent social change. And this can be brought about in many ways. Examples are things like um, non-violent protests, when maybe there's a match, a one-man match or a few people's match within a locality, or maybe, you know, different strategies, things like boycotting, they could boycott um, the other party that, uh, that there's conflict with, things like that, right? So there are different strategies that come under non-violent social change. There's also government and multilateral efforts where the government can come in and chip in their own quota into resolving the conflict in that location, maybe providing some sort of support. There's also a humanitarian action where the people that are involved in that conflict are provided humanitarian aid. 
right? They are supported by humanitarian or philanthropists, and this can encourage them to come to a peaceful resolution, right? So this this area here that uh, you need to just follow the colors. When you follow the colors, you are able to see what falls under each one. So these colors here fall under violence prevention. Now let's look at what falls under structural and institutional change. It's this from this place to this place falls under structural and institutional change. Development is one of it. All right. So there's a belief that um. Places that are least developed have a lot of issues, have a lot of conflict, they have a lot to quarrel about. So most times, in order to bring structure and institutional change, remember that by structure we mean something that is long-term, something that can stretch into generations to come. The approach is by seeking for development. So slums, areas that are, you know, the standard of living there is very poor, when the conflict is very high, Development, when it started in that area, can take many years to actually um, get to a, a quite a good development standard. But you see that that development can begin to cause some structural change, can begin to um, slightly uh, break down the conflict, the violence that is that is rife in that region. All right. Then another one is dealing with transnational and global threats, and this is. Some of the places that you see some agencies coming, some global powers coming, right? Usually they will come in to help to fight those threats. Now, what qualifies as transnational and global threats? There are things like terrorism, you know, things that constitute security threats that are not really originated from a single country, but maybe it's from a lot of places. So lots of countries usually join hands into dealing with all of these things at the same time. All right, or maybe when um another country maybe comes up with weapons, not really a country, maybe a non-governmental group that is classified as a terrorist organization comes up with weapons of mass destruction. So you see that lots of countries come together to help uh, deal with those threats. Another thing you see under um structural and institutional change is law and um under it you see advocacy and solidarity. So when there's conflict, when there's um um, violence that stretches on and then there is need to change it structurally there is need to change it um for time in memorial for generations to come sometimes law is the solution so they, they they will need to have people that can represent the case internationally nationally bring up the matter settle something for generations to come so things like land disputes between countries between two regions sometimes law is this resolution for those situations, when there's advocacy for them, when there's solidarity for those um, situations. Then under justice and healing, the sub um, groups that we see there is restorative justice, transitional justice, and trauma healing. Now let's talk about trauma healing. So trauma healing is where those people are talked through um, therapy sessions, they're made to talk, they're made to um, express how they actually feel. And when they're able to talk and express how they feel, they begin to gain control over their lives. They begin to seek for peace. They begin to, you know, resolve to stay clear of conflict and violence. Now, transitional justice is a large scale of dealing with um, usually human rights issues that prevail in a country. Maybe a country that has been deep into lots of years of conflict and violence and there are lots of human rights issues that needs to be addressed human rights violations that needs to be addressed then the solution could be trans transitional justice transitional justice um, focuses on making sure that those human rights um, violations are resolved that is there's an end to those human rights violations and there's a sort of um restitution or reparation where the people that have suffered, maybe the people that have lost their lives because their human rights were, were violated, there's a commemoration day for them. So you may see there's a day for so, so, so something. Because transitional justice has been seen as a solution to get everybody to be at peace and discontinue violence and conflict. It usually takes years and a lot of processes to this. There's also restorative justice. Rest restorative justice focuses on rehabilitating the offenders, the people that have caused violence, the, the major perpetrators of violence. So it's there, it's, there is a focus on rehabilitating those offenders through reconciliation with the community or with the victims at large. 
Now, all of these things here, they are usually professionals that um that specialize in each of these subgroups. All right. So this is just to let you have an idea of what the peace building pathway is. They are actually professionals that their jobs is to just be peace builders. They are the ones that um, negotiate broker peace and make sure that there is peace between regions and between country, countries. So now we've had an idea of what the strategic peace building pathway is like. Let's look at the importance of peace building. So peace building avoids conflict from escalating and it also helps to prevent conflict. Peace building fosters unity and togetherness amongst people. Peace building contributes to development. So the truth is that when there's peace, then there's much more likelihood of development. There's much more likelihood of progress of economic advancement in a region. Think about it. Any region that has had um, years of war is usually one of the poorest regions because there's no um there's no progress there there's no economic activity that has been done there is just lots of violence and so that can lead to a lot of um economic um backwardness so peace building contributes to development is important for every country now let's look at characteristics of peace building what does um peace building characterize on so you things you see things like um building on local capacities to manage and resolve conflicts peacefully so what this means is that the local people that are involved the things that make up um the people that are in that region are always included are always involved to to help manage and resolve conflicts there's also local ownership by local ownership, it means that those that are involved in the conflict, they are brought together. Maybe the, the leaders of that area, the people of that area, brought together. Maybe when it's, when there's a dialogue to come for a di dialogue and um, there's, there's a conclusion that is reached for peace building. Then it also incorporates conflict sensitivity. What this means is that we there is an understanding that each conflict differs from another conflict, and so that particular conflict there is sensitivity to what led to it, who are the actors in it. By actors, I mean who are the people involved in that conflict. Why, 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 why did they not want to end it at that point in time? So that all those factors are put into consideration so that peace can be built, peace can be arrived at. And there's also inclusiveness of um, all relevant stakeholders. If the youth are involved and if the traditional rulers need to be heavily involved, they are put in through the planning and the implementation of maintaining peace. There are different peace building approaches that exist as well. The first is development and transformation of relationships. So you see things like dialogues, they come in here. Community um, solidarity building activities. There are different games activities that can be planned for the people involved in the conflict to come together in order to start building and forming relationships. As I said, there are professionals that are gifted, that are skilled, that are trained in brokering this kind of um, relationship. So they understand the strategies to use and all of that. So sometimes the approach could be the development and transformation of relationships. Understanding that the two people in that conflict do not have any existing relationship and then there's an effort to build the relationship between those two groups, between those two people. And then there's also the building of capacity. So as we saw in that uh, strategic pathway, some things like um, education could come in. When the people involved are better educated, then they could be able to arrive at peace, right? There's also strengthening of effective and non-harming traditions. Maybe traditions like activities, festivities that the two groups can do together and then they can arrive at um, having better relationships, having better capacity to do things together. So these are just um, some of the approaches that you can see in key in, in Peace in key peace building. There are lots of other approaches, but then the professionals are best aware of that. So when it comes to the basic one that every other person should know, these are the two approaches. Why are we talking about peace building? Because it's important that we understand how to um, manage conflicts that could arise, arise at workplaces, 
where we are working, at the new businesses that we are starting. There are instances when conflicts are not managed very well, then there will be violence. So we need to understand things like dialogue could help resolve it. Things like education, educating the two people involved, coming up with activities that will make people to sit down and actually face each other and have con conversations could help. All right. There are still cases where maybe legal um, matters could help solve that matter. But this is helping us to see the picture of how these things can be resolved. Sometimes, too, when you are at a business, the business could have issues with the local community. And these are certain approaches that can be used. Dialogue, education. So this is why we are bringing this to everyone today. Now, communication is a key part of peace building. So we're going to take a, a deep dive into what communication is all about. So communication is a process of imparting or exchanging information by speaking, writing, or using any other medium. It involves people, it involves shared meanings and symbols, and it could be verbal or non-verbal. So we already have an idea of communication before now. And the essence of communication is in order to inspire, to motivate, to persuade, and to inform. These four things are the major essences of communication. And there's a, li a li likelihood of misinterpretation, misinformation, and misuse in actualizing these four essences. So that's why it's important that communication needs to be effective. So what is effective communication? It's verbal and non-verbal expression that is clearly and successfully delivered, received, and understood. It is a communication in which no one gets confused about the other person's meaning. Then, in peace building, effective communication is conflict sensitive, right? Because it doesn't, it does not cause or escalate conflict, but helps in the search for sustainable solutions. So you see why we're bringing up the concept of communication because it's important for peace building. When communication is effective in the course of um, peace building, you see that um, there is, it doesn't escalate conflict. It helps in, instead in looking for solutions for um, reducing the conflict, for de-escalating de it. So there are skills for effective communication. And we already went through this in one of our topics, but I'll do a quick rush through once again. There's attention to nonverbal signals, capacity to be con culturally and contextually sensitive. Now, what does this mean? It means that you may be coming from a different culture to meet the people that are involved in a conflict. And if you are not attentive enough to understand what are the things that are a taboo, all of the things that are frowned upon in that new culture that you're coming into, then you may um, help to even escalate the conflict. So it's important to have the um, cultural and contextual sensitivity of where you are getting into. Then another skill is the ability to frame a message clearly and directly to keep stress and emotion at check. Because when you're actually trying to help two groups, two people to build peace, there are situations when you are stressed, when you are just angry about the entire process. And when you let that show, when you actually allow all those emotions show, then you may even help escalate the conflict. Another one is the capacity to listen actively. We're going to be talking about what active listening is all about in detail. And then another one is the ability to ask or tell someone to do something without evoking negative emotions on either side. There are instances when you're trying to build peace, you could tell a party, oh, do this. The other party may get offended and say, oh, you don't tell us to do the same thing as well. So this is, is just to make you understand that... Um, you need to be an active listener. You need to understand the different people that are involved in any conflict situation. Now, there are barriers to effective conflict, to, to effective communication. So, judgments based on cultural differences. Now, all, the, all of these things that are barriers to effective communication could be from your own side as somebody that may be trying to build peace or from the other party that um, is trying to be um, reconciled or built uh, pieces being built with that side and another side so if there's judgment based on cultural differences especially when the two parties involved are of different cultures you will see that there's um, a barrier to effective communication the other party does not 
just do, does not just want to listen anymore. They've lost interest because, oh, we are being judged because of where we are from. So ensure that in your speech, in the other party's speech, there is no judgment of um, cultural differences. Mental and emotional states could also be uh, a barrier. So if one of the parties has a low mental state, maybe is now um, traumatized by the things that happen, is um, very sad, very um, emotional, crying a lot about what happened, you may not be able to get them to actually um, come to a resolution. So it's always important that when you come to that kind of situation that you can um, reschedule or come up with another solution at that point in time. Show empathy that could help the parties involved. Inappropriate tone of communication is also another barrier to effective communication. If the tone that you're using to communicate seems um, rude, if it seems um, uh, uh, incompassionate, then you, you will see that those people that are involved don't want to listen to you anymore. Another one is display of inappropriate body language. If it seems like you're tired, like you're in a hurry to leave, you may see that they don't really want to stay a lot because they're trying to help you also leave on time. So ensure that you display the right body language. Defensiveness or premature assumptions could also be a barrier to effective communication. So when you are defensive, when the other group is defensive towards something, when they are not really being silent and acknowledging and saying how it felt for them, it could uh, lead to barriers in effective communication. When the other group is still making assumptions and not really listening to the other party on what they are saying, you see that there is um, a heavy barrier to effective communication. Another one is a distracting or noisy environment. When the environment around there is really noisy, they, they may not be able to pay attention to either party or to you at that point in time. So what is active listening in communication? What do we mean when we talk about active listening in communication? All right. What do you think about it? Let me know in the comment section. You can drop what you think about it in the comment section. Now, active listening is a way of listening and responding to another person such that it improves mutual understanding. And we already talked about this at the time when we did the communications class. So we we'll also do a brief run through of it. It could be at verbal or non-verbal levels. At verbal levels, it involves rephrasing, encouraging, questioning, restating, summarizing. So if you think um, somebody that is listening to you wants to further get the person's attention, wants to further get the person to respond, you can ask the person questions, all right? You can tell the person to summarize, right? So that you ensure that the other person um, understands as well. So at non-verbal level, um, it involves smile open posture, forward lean, eye contact, nod. So usually when you are in a non-virtual situation, you will look out for both things, both verbal and non-verbal um, um, levels of active listening. You will look out for, are the people actually listening to you? Are they maintaining eye contact with you? Are they nodding when you say things that require nods? So these are things that you should look out for. You need to ensure that those that you are speaking with, those that you are speaking to are actually listening and responding, that they are actually understanding. So let's look at these reflections on communication. Effective communication is the life wire of a peaceful relationship. When a relationship is not peaceful, you will notice that there is no communication there or the communication that is existent is not effective enough. With effective communication, disputes or potential disputes could be effectively resolved. So this, this shows more light on the importance of communication. Most of the time, when there's serious disputes, then there's conflict between two parties or two groups or two people. It's communication that has to be seriously worked on in that situation. Right. So let's go forward to how do we manage conflict? When conflict arises, how do we manage it? And then what is the entire concept of conflict management? So conflict management is the practice of reducing the negative events of conflict, the negative aspects of conflict, while increasing the positive aspects of conflict. And it is a process of transforming conflict for the benefit of humanity and the environment. Remember that we mentioned that it's the response or the reaction to conflict that makes it positive or negative. So when you're managing conflict, you're ensuring that there's more of the positive than the negative. 
It entails the practice of being able to identify and handle conflict so that it does not escalate to violence because very quickly, conflict usually escalates to violence. Now, let's look at escalation and escalation. Esca conflict escalation is a process by which conflicts grow in severity over time. And it can occur at a lot of levels, personal levels. Two people could um, have the conflict that they have amongst themselves escalate, grow, become bigger. Between two groups, between two nations, even in on international levels, all right? So, usually, when it's escalating, it means that, that, that it's increasing, it's growing in severity. Conflict is, escalation is the opposite. It's the reduction of tension or bringing down conflict from the crisis stage and also refers to approaches de deployed towards conflict resolution. That means conflict escalation is a conscious process where that conflict that should have escalated, there are strategies, there are things, approaches that are deployed to ensure that it does not escalate, that is actually brought down, that is actually reduced to um to from a not for a, from a crisis stage to a non-crisis stage. Now there are actions that can escalate conflict. Let's look at those actions. One of them is taking sides. When one 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 a peace builder is taking side uh, with another party, you see that the other party will say, "Oh, is that how what it has come to?" And then they will escalate the conflict. They would not want to come to a peaceful resolution anymore. When one or both parties involved feel threatened, and sometimes both parties may feel threatened, they may feel like, "Oh, if you actually resolve to keep peace, if you actually resolve to build this peace, then." Um, we may end up being targeted, we may end up being wiped away. There could be different um, fears that they have, different um, objections that they have towards resolving the conflict. Then when there is no interest in maintaining the, conf the relationship, and usually this is because when they've seen uh, there's no point, they just don't want to make um, peace, they don't want to maintain the relationship. When there's increase in the show of anger and fear and frustration, you see that these, these things can escalate conflict then when there are lack of skills needed for peace building these things can also escalate conflict so i hope that we've also seen some of the things that we can use in peace building because when your skills are really on the minimal level on a very low level it can even escalate conflict so always ensure that you're not taking sides that you're not doing any of these things that can escalate conflict now let's look at the actions that can de-escalate conflict actions that can reduce conflict. So one of them is focusing on the issues and not on the persons or the parties involved. There's the temptation of wanting to say, oh, this happened because you are this sort of person, or this happened because you are that sort of person. But when you're able to leave the personalities involved, you leave the groups involved and focus on the issue at hand, you are better able to de-escalate the conflict because people don't want to ever be directly pointed at as the cause of something, all right? Another one is when there is reduction or elimination of perceived threats. So when the two groups feel like, oh, we are under threats, and so we don't want to actually um, build peace, you can be able to address those objections that they have, assure them in a credible manner, and then those people may now work with you towards the escalating the conflict. Another one is when needs are expressed and openly discussed. So one party could have a need and the other party could have a need. When you encourage both, both parties involved to speak up, to discuss their need, discuss how they want it to be met, you see that they see that um, there's a point towards the escalating the conflict. They may be much more willing to de-escalate the conflict because they've started talking about it, because they've started looking at ways to meet their own needs and then resolve their conflict. Then emotions of anger, ETC, when they are expressed in a direct rather than indirect manner, they can actually help to de escalate conflict. Because when people bottle up emotions and then um, show it in an indirect manner, you can see that these actions not escalate the conflict. But when they show it in a direct manner, when they're able to stand up and say, Oh, I'm unhappy, I don't like that, I don't like that, you will see that it helps everybody to understand everybody's position. There's a, a faster um way route towards um the escalating the conflict rather than when everybody is bottling up their emotions and feeling at, at at peace with each other when that's not the case another one is when people involved realize and use their peace building skills every one of us can build our peace building skills and it's always a process it's always something that will keep um, um helping ourselves to improve on so there are approaches for handling conflicts and one of them is the 
We are going to look at five of them. To begin with, we are going to look at avoidance. Now, what is the avoidance approach? In this approach, you see that the star is on low assertiveness and low cooperation. You see that the people that are involved withdraw from the conflict. So avoidance is where one party withdraws from the conflict. So in situations like this, you could see that the issue at hand is trivial. It's something they can dodge from, they can stay away from. And usually in this situation, you will see that um, one party may be ignoring the other party, pretending that like they are not aware of what could be done to remedy the situation. Now, in confrontation, you will see that in this situation, one party is confronting the other party. So that party that confronts the other party is said to be imposing their own will on the other party. And there could be use of force, use of intimidation, use of blackmail, and so on. In compromise, you will see that um, both sides, both parties that are involved in the conflict are able to give up their position in that conflict in order to reach a resolution in order to arrive at a solution so compromise means that they actually agree on something that they will work on usually you see that both parties involved in this hold um, equivalent power like um, each other and you will see this commonly in business transactions accommodating means that um, the opposing opposing party is able to give the other party what they want. So, for example, in an office environment where, um, for example, the office indicates that everybody needs to appear on their business suits every day. And if the staff decide to approach the management and say, oh, these business suits every day is not really conducive for us or the culture around here, we need to accommodate casuals, the, uh, the management could decide to co to accommodate their concerns. They could decide, okay, once a week on Friday, some of you can wear casuals or tradition traditional. So accommodating is usually used in business settings, in those kind of situations, to actually accommodate um, issues that are perceived as minor. Right. So, in joint problem solving, you see that both parties involved actually come together to now resolve the conflict. You will see that the outcome that is arrived at is called a win-win situation. They both um, come together to resolve the, the conflict that they are actually facing. And it involves two strategies called negotiation and mediation. And now we're going to be looking at what negotiation entails. Now, negotiation is a process by which disputing parties settle their differences without the involvement of a third party. That means uh, the two people that are involved in a conflict will be able to arrive at a, a negotiation. They will be able to arrive at a compromise or agreement in order to establish, sustain their relationship to resolve their conflict. But this is very different from mediation. So you see that in negotiation, two parties, the two parties that are involved, they come together. They don't need an external person. They don't need a third party between them. But in mediation, it is different. It needs the intervention of a skilled intermediary, intermediary working to, to facilitate that um, negotiation between, between them. So you see that in negotiation, there is involvement of a third party. Now, there are certain things that are involved in mediation, and what some of them include that there needs to be voluntary participation by the disputing parties. So, if you are trying to be the third party that is mediating between two parties, you need to ensure that those two parties involved voluntarily participated. They voluntarily signed up to sitting down for the mediation. It's not something that use of force can be used to achieve. And there needs to be face-to-face -face discussions between the parties in conflict. This is because it can help to arrive as um, re resolutions easily. And then it's always important that the mediator is unbiased and does not have decision-making power. The mediator is not there to 
make the decision for them. He's just helping them to arrive at a decision that both of them agree on. And then the mediator has to also um, provide equal opportunities for all participants to speak and explain their own perspective, how they feel slighted, how they feel like um, they can arrive at a resolution. And when they do arrive at a resolution, it should be a shared agreement between the parties. It shouldn't be like someone recommended something and the other one is grumbling and saying, okay, let's do it so we can end this thing we're doing. It needs to be an agreement that both parties agree to. And there are skills for effective mediation. Active listening skills, we've talked about this previously, is important. Questioning and clarifying skills. That means that the mediator needs to be someone that understands the right kind of questions to ask for time. Not questions that seem to box the answers in a corner, but questions that give liberty for the parties involved to be able to throw in their suggestions, open up their hearts and talk. The mediator also needs to have the capacity to help the parties that are in dispute work together to develop their own agreement. So this um, capacity could be a form of emotional capacity or work-wise in terms of coming up with agreement, legal tenders, etc. And then in mediation, um, the mediator needs to have emotional intelligence to understand the underlying problems. This means the person is always poking things coming up with different ways, different strategies to get questions, to get answers out of the parties that are involved. The mediator also needs to show empathy. And this empathy will help each party to be able to see um, the other person, the other party in their own shoes, and then to be able to understand their own point of view. It's also important that the mediator is not biased at all, whether it's verbally or non-verbally he needs to he or she needs to be neutral and the mediator needs to understand when it's time for um for them to actually stop to withdraw especially when it seems like both parties are not able to arrive at a resolution and it's about escalating into violence now there's something called conflict sensitivity And conflict sensitivity is when the intervener understands the conflict and its context, the potential things that could have caused conflict, that could cause conflict, the stage and level of any conflict, all right? So this is called conflict sensitivity. It's always important that a mediator, anybody involved in peace building gets to understand um, conflict sensitivity, what it's all about. So, in conflict sensitivity, there's understanding of the context in which you operate. What do you need to do at that point in time? What are the negative or positive aspects of coming in to mediate, of coming in to try and build peace? Because it's always important that the positive aspects outweigh the negative aspects. In situations where it seems like the negative aspects could outweigh the positives then it's it's important for the mediator to be conflict sensitive to understand how to negotiate the situation maybe leave it to a later time before trying to actually help out in the situation now um in the workplace there are certain issues that um are potential um conflict causes so these are conflict sensitivity issues that you can see in the workplace so things like a person's culture a person's location where the person lives where the person grew up from the person's age religion level of education dressing communication pattern learning style these are things that are potential conflict causes if it's not handled very well you could see um, employees at work fighting over these issues they seem like little issues but these are conflict sensitivity issues that could come up in the workplace someone may feel slighted because someone thought he was too young at uh, at um to be working at an office, someone may feel slighted because another person disrespected their religion, someone may feel slighted because another person felt that they are not educated enough. So these are issues that are likely going to come up in the workplace. And it's important that these conflict sensitivity issues are put into consideration. And when um, they are put into consideration, it means that they are being managed. One of the ways to manage conflict sensitivities of this nature in the workplace is by building relationships. 
So most times, HRs, human resource managers of certain organizations, workplaces, end up um, crafting new ways that people in an organization can be able to build and foster relationships with one another. Because when they are able to build relationships, they can be able to bond with one another. And there are strategies that they develop that they um, encourage them to adopt in order to maintain those relationships. Because it's, it's, it's regarded as when you have a relationship with somebody, you are better aware of the things that may cause conflict and you stay clear of them. And apart from that, Building relationships helps to open opportunities for the people in the workplace, such as inclusion in new projects, awards, employment, and ETC. And there are strategies generally. You may not be an HR where you get to, but you need to understand these strategies that are important for building good relationships. Because sometimes you may go to a workplace and maybe there's no elaborate strategy on building relationships as a strategy for managing these um, conflict sensitivity issues. So you need to be aware of these strategies. And some of them is um, you will need to develop your people skills. You need to understand how to relate with people. You need to understand how to hold conversation. Be a good conversationalist. You need to identify your relationship needs. When you are actually in relationships, working relationships, friendships, what are the things that matter to you? Do you need validation, affirmation from the other parties? When you're able to know yourself very well, you can be able to um, better communicate your needs to somebody that is in the relationship. You are better able to communicate, oh, these are the areas that may slight you or better understand the areas that may slight the next person. And then it's always important to schedule time to build relationships because relationships are actually work. And if you don't schedule time to build it, then it may not be in existence. It's also important that you focus on your emotional intelligence. Do you understand verbal cues, non-verbal cues? Are you able to know the tone of an environment, the tone of people, their mood? Are you able to know the right things to say at the right time? And then it's also important to appreciate people that you're working with, especially when you're working in teams. Appreciate people for their efforts, for their progress, and all of that. It's also important as a strategy for building good working relationships to be positive and to manage your boundaries. All of these things, when you do it, you will notice that you're better able to work um, on good terms with other people in your workplace. And now we've come to an exciting end of the entire soft skills training. And I'm so excited for your journey and your progress so far. If, if there's any part that you skipped, that you didn't understand or you have questions don't forget to drop it on slack okay drop any question that you have on slack and once again take the post test this will be the last post test ever that you need to take on this soft skills training take it at this link and see you on slack